All right, good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, this is the Making Alien versus Predator 25th anniversary retrospective. Thanks for uh, waking up and joining me this morning. Um, we'll just start things off with a little video here, some clips. Guy. That's James Grunke right there. And this is our first drop in for Lady as a Marine and Alien vs. Predator. You could say that Paul... <laughs> okay, so that's the game, and um, that's how we originally launched it. And these next set of videos are a couple of clips from an Atari press release that was made to sort of meant to be faux news, if you will. <laughs> kind of a way of uh, telling the story about how to introduce the game you know, to, peop um, to people. And they, uh, this is 1994 marketing. Long developed by Atari, initiated a video game revolution, creating a generation of gaming enthusiasts. But that was then, and this is now. The latest technology to hit the video screen opens the door to a brave new world in which players become marines, aliens, or predators pitted against each other to the bitter end. The action seems so real that, well, maybe it's not a game anymore. Mom. just-released Alien vs. Predator takes full advantage of the 64-bit technology. Based on the two films from 20th Century Fox, the game is expected to be a mega-hit as well. With such realistic effects, the limiting factor is no longer the technology, but the player's cunning and nerve. Alien vs. Predator is the kind of game where you can lose time in. You can start the game at, say, 8 o'clock at night and find yourself at 2 in the morning still playing, still going, and still wanting to go. While we haven't had any confirmed reports of people losing their jobs or, you know, losing their friends and family, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Purple Hampton. I'm with the... And this is... <laughs> I know, it's like, who's that guy, right? <laughs> Um, so we showed it at um, CES a couple of times. This is the last time before we um, launched that summer in 1994. And this clip comes courtesy of um, the great uh, Biff's uh, classic video gaming channel. So always uh, check him out. The Atari Corporation, I'm the producer on, uh, been on the producer on Crescent Galaxy, Club Drive, and now Alien vs. Invented producer on Alien vs. Predator for the last 18 months. Um, started at Atari coming from Max and Lucasfilm and picked up the Alien vs. Predator project uh, as a Lynx game originally, where it was started out as a design to be a side-scrolling platform puncher, and we took the design at Atari and revamped it to be the first person perspective, three played three different players on three different motivations and three types of missions into the game. However, the true shining moment for the system was the first person shooter, Aliens vs. Predator. This really was the first game that I can remember anyway that allowed you to not only play uh, the game from three different perspectives, but it also offered you uh, unique experiences. The idea that you're going to play all three species, human, alien, and predator, goes back to this Atari version. This was not created with the first of the PC games. Introducing Alien vs. Predator for the 64-bit Atari Jaguar. You might not want to play it alone. Ah! Mom. Ah. There we go. That's the 
<laughs> AVP real. So <laughs> that commercial was actually made at the same time as the um, as the Chicago CES. And so while we were in town, we got to be part of the um, the filming of that. And all they did was make the arm of the alien, so <laughs> holding a sort of plastic prop arm, as it were. Um, again, uh, I'm James Hampton. I was a producer and designer on the pro title. Uh, and I'm the maker of AVP, or one of the, the leader of the, the producer of AVP. Um, when I started at Atari, it was October of 1992. I was 22 years old. I had just came from leading up the test departments at Lucasfilm Games and Maxis, and was given an opportunity as one of my friends I used to work with at Lucasfilm, their sister worked in the business department at Atari and mentioned that they were hiring producers for uh, their new 64-bit game console. And um, first thing out the gate, I got a giant stack of um, projects to work on, and the first title out the gate was Alien vs. Predator. So um, Alien vs. Predator, if you're familiar with the series, obviously stems from the movies Alien and Predator from the 80s, but was first developed as a concept of the two universes sort of mixing together as a Dark Horse comic series um, in the late 80s. Uh, stemming from that came a Super Nintendo version um, that was originally developed by a Japanese developer and published by Activision. And Activision had a pretty close relationship with, the, um, with Atari, so Atari was able to get a sub-license from them uh, via their uh, Chicago office. Atari had an office of, that did a lot of development um, in the early 90s on the Lynx titles that was out of Chicago, and that's how AVP Lynx got, began. Uh, AVP Lynx, um, which still floats out there to this day, was developed originally by Images Software. Uh, Carl Jeffries, he did um, Climax Entertainment later, but uh, was a big developer. When I visited him, their shop was literally over a chippy shop <laughs> where you could get uh, stuff to eat. They were working on things like Hasbro Cluedo at the time, but it was um, a game that was like partway in development. Um, this was the original uh, Super Nintendo title, and technically, According to the contract, we were supposed to be making a port of this game. So, I don't know if you remember this, but this is more of a final fight game where you're a predator punching out aliens on the side, which had its appeal, but didn't really, for us as fans of the film at Atari, didn't really do it what we wanted it to as far as treating those characters well. So, um, AVP Links, it did get made, but not finished. So, the, um, this is sort of the basic timeline in 89, the comic, series came out in early 92, before the um, Super Nintendo version was released, because it was released um, later in 93, they did get the contract underway and get it started, thus bringing us to AVP Lynx, which got started by the Chicago office, and in the late summer of 92, uh, the Chicago office was closed, and I was hired on to, to bring it in. So the AVP Lynx was a um, sort of set us in motion, and, and from the get-go, it was a game where you're supposed to be able to play both the um, human marine and the predator side, but they didn't include the alien game for some reason, which one we never found. Uh, when I first started at Atari, there were things where the chaos that made the things um, difficult at Atari was the same chaos that made it good. So <laughs> I was basically given a list of titles and it was up to me to kind of figure out the rest from there. I had to pour through contracts, get contact numbers, make phone calls, and at the time, um, Sort of for me, it was sort of a step back in time. Atari didn't have a internal computer network, for example. Everything, it was the sneaker net. So if you had a file transfer, you literally put it on a floppy and walked it down to the person you were working with. But coming from Maxis and Lucasfilm, which were all Mac Central at the time and had networks already, it was sort of strange kind of stepping back. So there was no email. We did everything through faxes. Um, I know it sounds a little bit retro, but um, we all were made to use um, the Atari uh, ST computers and their printing gear. We didn't have PCs, we didn't have Macs, even though that's what I had just came from working with. <laughs> um, the, link, the images people did a really nice job. The, the Lynx one had a fairly decent story where, you know, the Marine coming up against the Predator, the Predator coming up against the Marine. Um, the gameplay was sort of centric at the time. Everyone, you know, if you were a game player, you were playing Wolfenstein, you were playing, you know, you were excited about the new development that id was doing, which was Doom coming down the line. And the first person shooter game was something that was on everyone's sort of minds, including the people at Images. So they started, 
then that down that direction. This is a pretty simplistic view. It's a lynx, but I always regret not having uh, being able to get this one finished just because it did have some promise, and the Lynx is still one of my favorite handheld systems there. It would have been great to have the three-player multiplayer aspect. Um, the one thing that the Predator, the Link, AVP Lynx Predator, uh, Alien vs. Predator game is that it included quite a few reference to the Dark Horse comic characters and locations, and this was what I call the wedge. <laughs> it gave us a legal reason to for me to first initially campaign the Lords at Atari, that we had to change the design and submit a new design to Activision and 20th Century Fox to be considered. And the wedge was, oh, we don't have the rights to use these Dark Horse Comics characters. And certainly we did not, and that was enough. That was enough to be like, okay, you can resubmit a new design to us. And that's what gave us some runway to come up with the design that we have, which was, you wanna play the alien, you wanna play the predator, you wanna play the marine, all in one game. Um, the ultimate sad story of the title was that it, um, all efforts on Link's titles was stop, were stopped at Atari. They were basically trying to finish whatever was within finishing range, and unfortunately, AVP was about midway in development. And I think you can still find every so often on eBay an EEPROM cart that has sort of a semi-playable demo, but emphasis on the semi part. So <laughs> um, and this is the second part of the timeline. I started there in, um, as I said, October of 92, was assigned as the producer. And at that point, everything at Atari was gearing up to move towards the Jaguar development. So late in the winter, early spring, uh, Atari hosted a developers conference at their headquarters in Sunnyvale. And that's when um, Rebellion Software was brought in and earned the contract for the first Alien vs. Predator game. Um, we sort of collaborated with both teams in America and in Oxford, um, sort of sharing design documents back and forth. The spirit at Atari was, again, we were fans of the movies first. You know, we love this stuff. <laughs> and so we spent a lot of time, um, people who didn't work on the projects, uh, other producers, Ted Takichi, who I'll meant to talk about later, he and his wife hosted um, many series of movie nights at their house, which were movie nights, brainstorming sessions, and really just kind of getting to the core as we, as fans of these series, what did we want to see out of it and what was really important. And we sort of was able to collaborate through these fax documents back and forth with the UK developer, Rebellion, to sort of encourage them to do their same process and sort of see where our ideas met in the middle. Um, part of that process was also kind of changing the way Atari thought about things. So when I started there, I'll just say Atari was kind of stepping into a time machine. They didn't quite, one of my first early meetings with uh, Sam Trammell, the president, was just explaining to him how I had just come from a place like Lucasfilm where I, I worked on Monkey Island and Monkey Island was a game that had north of two dozen people working on the title for nine to 12 months at a time and that doesn't include like the product support and even us in testing, um, just sort of nonstop. And for, to Sam, that was a, sort of a bit off his, what he was used to. The games in the early Atari days were sometimes created by a single or one or two people. Just the idea that a team of a dozen or two dozen people would be working on a single game, he was like, how is that possible? How do they make money? It's like, well, they sell that many of them. So my, um, the encouragement of what I learned is that people can change, and including Sam Trammell, so uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But he definitely uh, grew as a person and grew as a manager of like what was necessary to make a game in 1993. And uh, this is it. This is um, the Atari crew, uh, both the, um, at, during the, the critical time of the development was really the summer of 94, where we uh, brought all the development into ha internally to the Atari headquarters in Sunnyvale and it included some of the, um, the main programmers from Rebellion, who uh, you see highlighted here. That's on the left is um, Mike Beaton, he's the lead programmer, and Andrew Whitaker, who was the AI and uh, another programmer brought on. And um, their story's pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll get to them in a second, but um, what Rebellion really did is that they had a, the people, you know, uh, Jason Kingsley and his brother Chris had a very keen design sense and they were the ones who really um, the, brought in the art, their art department of uh, Stuart Wilson and Toby Banfield. They originally started out doing 
more looking 16-bit hand-drawn art, um, but then since we realized that Jaguar could do photorealistic textures, they tested out and it really as a proof of concept and it really did work of using actual photographs so and models and physical models instead of uh, digital assets. And so they got into the process of animating um, from resin model kits, putting them on armatures and doing stop motion animation style and using bathroom tiles that they decorated with model parts and spray painted for the walls, the floors, the ceilings, the environments, everything across the board. It was really, um, it was both a new way of doing it and old way of doing it when you think about it. As, but it was one of the, since the Jaguar was one of the first systems to really be able to um, do photorealistic textures more readily than before, it allowed us to sort of uh, take that and run with it a little bit. Here's an example of uh, the alien model on its armature, one of the uh, bathroom tiles. This has been cleaned up. I was a terrible photographer at the time. <laughs> I didn't bring a flash. Um, this is a version of the Alien Queen, and the Alien Queen comes with uh, <laughs> that. The Alien Queen was a big stumbling block for us. Um, we we're glad we were able to finally get it in, but at a critical time, we were weren't sure if we were able to finish the game because of this Alien Queen, and um, that brings us to this. So, <laughs> in the middle of the development, I don't know if you're familiar with the creator um, H.R. Giger. His work is considered controversial or even pornographic by some. And at the time, UK customs were fairly stringent about such, such things. So anything that was labeled as pornography got stopped at the border. And so specifically, the alien queen, being the character that she is, was designated as being pornographic material. And so despite several times that they ordered it from several different sources, they couldn't get it through UK customs. And so um, what I discovered, again, being a producer at Atari was the first time I was a producer, is your job is to get stuff done. <laughs> by hook or by crook, we don't care how you do it, we just need to get done. So um, I'm originally from New England. I grew up uh, watching um, like Star Blazers and you know, Robotech in the afternoon and one of the big advertisers was this place called Mr. Big's Toyland, which specifically imported all the Japanese you know, metal versions of like the Valkyrie from Robotech and cool stuff like that. It was always like my favorite job, okay? <laughs> but I always remembered that they had a massive model section and they did in fact have the Alien Queen model in stock. So I made a point to, um, you know, drive over to Waltham, visit Mr. Big's Toyland, and then smuggle it through customs. <laughs> because what they don't do is they don't really, you know, they may not even reckon, the people who are gonna be shaking down your bags that. Heathrow don't know what your alien model queen is and aren't certainly going to check the list that it's crossed off on. So <laughs> only through this, you know, this, this kind of a push is, is what you need to do to get kind of games done. And this is how we survived and got our alien queen into, into the final stage of the game. Um, Mike Beaton, Mike Beaton, no, oh, hey, let me go back. <laughs> Mike Beaton is um, soft-spoken, just one of this really dedicated, bright, people in the universe. And he had a very clear vision about how to render this world. And again, this is at the time where I know a lot of things are to take for granted in today's gaming standards, but this was cutting a lot of new ground for us. So while this, some people describe it as a two and a half D game because it doesn't have full up and down um, sort of environment, it, it still conveyed the experience of at the time of being that next level of what Wolfenstein promised to be. You know, we're gonna put it in a photorealistic world, but it was a fairly challenging environment. The, um, the Jaguar was still a new development piece of hardware. There wasn't a whole lot of support tools or software that were written for coders. Specifically, there was a philosophy of, if you need those things, you shouldn't be programming on it. But that did change over time, but it made that initial wave of development so challenging and things took a lot longer than, um, than they were originally supposed to. Um, we ended up bringing uh, most of the team over uh, starting in April or May, around May of 94, and they stayed through the summer. And we're basically, um, you know, there's people like Mike Beaton who was willing to basically give up his life. I think we had him there in the States for like about three months solid, where we pretty much worked 24-7, um, around kind of around the clock cycle. It wasn't entirely all work and no play. We did try to take them on field trips. There was an amusement park two cities down from where Atari was that we would um, go on on breaks while builds were compiling, things like that. We had season passes, uh, but we did try to like take them out. So 
At the time, I was friends with quite a few people, but here in this photo is uh, Tabitha Toasty. The, um, she was the voice of the LucasArts hint line, if you ever called the hint line, the 900 number in the 90s, that was her. <laughs> Andy Harris, um, he was uh, part of the Magenta, who the spin-off group that came out of Lore Design. Um, they did a bunch of the Stuart Little titles later on the PlayStation. Fran Thomason, he was a producer on things like Dino Dudes and Bubsy, again, friend of the, of the game. Andrew Whitaker, who even in his t-shirt wasn't chilly, something about northern British folks, they can withstand the cold. Uh, Steve Mitchell, the director of Lore Design, he was the leader of the Highlander Project, and Mike Beaton. So that's something that was like overall, there was a sort of a community sense of working with Atari. We were all friends together, we sort of worked together, we all sort of played together and kind of hung out as a group and it was sort of fun to, when pe different people were in town to sort of be able to show things off and be able to share some experiences with them. So um, by January of 94, we had reached the first playable version of the game and that's when we showed it at Chicago CES and that generated quite a bit of buzz for the game. So there were a lot of people excited about it. And at the time we were telling them that it was still on track for its original contract date, which was going to be a spring 94 release. Now the reality was, um, the contract at the time, again, was set to this other lower standard. Um, I wasn't privy to the contract negotiations, but I do know the impact, which was they ran out of money. And the money was, for the original part to get it done, had been fully spent, and the programmers, Mike and Andrew, um, stopped getting paid. So thankfully I'd build up out of enough of a relationship that they called me directly and just said, hey, we don't know what's going on. Um, at Rebellion side, from their perspective, they had invested everything and they could see it on the screen. The game looked great, but it was still in this sort of alpha stage of you could play only as the Marine. There was no story. It was a randomly generated map. You, the Predator and Aliens hadn't been implemented and it was sort of in this like demo state and they were ready to move on to their next new projects that they started and they weren't really concerned about this anymore. And this is. It was this moment that I realized I could um, make a difference. And that difference this time was to appeal to Sam Trammell. Now, Sam Trammell was, um, some, you know, he was a, a tough businessman and not known for spending um, extra resources on things. But this time, I think because of the amount of positive momentum we had gotten in the press, how people were excited about the title, I convinced him that we needed the extra time, that with the extra time we could make a great game. And despite all what I had been learned to previously believe, when the critical moment came, he said yes. He said yes, we can get extra time. Yes, we can bring the programmers to America. Yes, you can sit on them all summer long until they finish, <laughs> and which is what we ended up doing. And yes, we'll give you two extra megs on the cart. Yes, we'll, you know, which all of these things add to the production cost, which again at the time was, it was a fairly tightly controlled budget, but it made the all the difference in the world. The game would have not been anything without that extra summer, and so that's really where our focus came in, is that we brought a lot of the materials back so that we could shape up the game and actually implement the design that we had hoped to see out of it. And that brings us to um, the folks at Atari. So again, while Rebellion was the original developer, they built the, the technology and tools, and to their credit, they created that fantastic art look. It was really um, everyone at Atari sort of rallying around the cause to sort of make the game happen. And I can't emphasize enough, I've been honored to work with these people and you can't demand people to give up their weekends or spend their nights, but <laughs> that summer everyone did. And it was why? Because we just wanted to make this game great. And we just, you know, if, we could, if it meant staying up one more night, 24 hours, okay, we'll do it. On the night we were taking it to 20th Century Fox for its final approval, that's what this crew did. So starting with um, uh, one of our main, um, one of the main influences of the game was is um, Sean Patton. Now you might recognize him. He's the guy in the corner. He's literally the face of Alien versus Predator. So um, he both led the design team. He was originally a tester, but he was also uh, our diehard Alien fan. And he's literally the face of Alien versus Predator. So if you look in the heads up display, while the character name is after the other tester um, and level designer, Lance J. Lewis, the photo we use is actually Sean Patton. So 
Sean was um, a tester at Atari when I, when I was introduced to him, who was a diehard uh, Aliens fan, so much so that he had actually created a full set of replicas based on uh, movie props based from the movies. And he was doing cosplay before even cosplay was a term. So <laughs> um, because of it, it gave us a lot of immediate reference to sort of match our photorealistic look. And we were able to use a lot of his um, gear to kind of like place and set things in, in, you know, in motion. Rebellion ended up uh, subcontracting or um, renting some of the equipment that had been used in the Alien War live action um, sort of uh, experience that was in London that you could go to in Piccadilly Circus. But these photos originally sort of helped set the team in motion and what we use as placeholders to, um, for, you know, while we're in the early stages of development and sort of give us that mark of what we were aiming to shoot for. He created pulse rifles, he had um, uniforms, he did the whole gear, and really just sort of gave us the scope of what we were after and what we were going to look for as far as how the game was going to play and what it was going to sort of feel like. And that continuity, we always felt like our game would, he helped ensure us that our game would be felt like it was cut from the same fabric as the Alien and Predator films. Um, obviously his talent was not unrecognized and it was no surprise when he was promoted to a producer as well and he's also the producer of what I think is the best original game on the Jaguar, Iron Soldier. He really had a sense for it and he really got it down and it was just excellent to see him kind of come round up out of the testing department and into his full right as a producer and designer of his own titles. He's really a gifted, really a gifted guy. Um, Dan McNamee. Uh, another tester turned level designer and really Dan was just always there like you know this photo I see on the side is taken in the middle of the Atari hallways at like 3 30 in the morning on that night before we took it to 20th Century Fox and I just can't say enough like people like Dan who you know set his life aside and to just sort of like put it push us you know we were going to spend that you know if it meant that extra six hours we could get one bit of more polish in Dan was the kind of guy who would do that, and as a producer, as a, as a friend, I, I can't, you know, emphasize enough just how cool it is to see people come around and really get behind it because they care about what, you know, what the gameplay is going to be. I mentioned uh, Tom Gillen. Tom Gillen was the, um, he's the second one from the, uh, from the left, and in the, I guess they're both wearing hats, but <laughs> he's the shorter of the two next to me. Um, Tom was the head of the uh, QA department at and ran the testing department at Atari. So all Lynx games, all Jaguar games went under his, you know, through his thumb and under his, and through his department. And it was, he was always an ally to this game. So from the very first time of getting assigned to the project, it was him, Tom, who helped me find where all the versions and all the source code for the images. And there's a lot of chaos at Atari again, no internal networks. So there's a lot of actual physical tracking down of floppy disks and materials and hard drives to kind of put things together. And it was really his dedication and willingness to sort of like always be up for doing that. And when push came to shove and we needed staff to really step up and do the level design work, Tom was okay and gave the approval for using his department of testers and let them become level designers for us, which again, changed the equation and helped save this game. Uh, Chris Hudak, uh, there was another game uh, that didn't get released, Black Ice, White Noise, was being co-developed by uh, BJ in the blue hair, but Chris is the guy on the right. Chris is a rabid science fiction writer and author and he helped really establish the sort of tone of the story and I know Again, it's a cartridge game, so we have a lot of full motion video to play with, but we did want to convey that there was a story and that there was this sort of thought process as to what the player is going to be doing as far as getting from the Marine, you know, from the Marine perspective, from the alien perspective, from the Predator. And he and Lance uh, co-wrote the manual for the game and did all the, um, the text in the game. Um, and just always came, again, one of the people who came through for us. James Grunke. James Grunke, uh, you've heard him all. <laughs> if you played this game at all, you've heard he's the voice of both the Predator, you know, over here, right? <laughs> and that guy of the Marine, you know, what the hell got a hold of this guy? <laughs> That's James Grunke. So, and again, in the 11th hour, about four weeks before we're supposed to do our final release to Fox, um, Sam Trammell and James Grunke and I met in Sam's office, and we both campaigned him to... Um, 
convince him that we needed the extra memory for audio. Now again, we had a kind of a legal reason. Fox definitely wanted one more, two more animation cycles, which pushed us just over the edge of our two meg limit initially. But it was us selling him on what the audio could do for the experience. And we got the extra two megs and we spent it almost entirely on the audio budget. So that part was, again, just fantastic. And in that short time, he was able to rally up people like M. Stevens, Alex Rudis, um, uh, Nate uh, Brendel, uh, just a few different people that is able to pull in from the Atari sphere to all kind of collaborate to make that sort of atmospheric sound effects, the music, the, the tone, the sort of the pulsing of the, of the sounds. And um, just to sort of like kind of really get us capture it and sort of step up again when, when needed, he was there. Um, I was sitting in James Grunke's office when we got to people like Sandra Miller. Um, so in the game, when you turn on the terminals, you, there's a computer, computer engaged <laughs> type of sound. And Sandra Miller uh, is the wife of Richard Miller, who was one of the primary architects of the Jaguar hardware design. And um, he, uh, when she was walking by once, they're both from England, and we heard her voice, and I was like, we were both had the same idea. Wait, that's it. There's our computer voice. Bring her in here. <laughs> and she was such a great trooper. She w was only to do the record the lines. But again, it's just that kind of like pitching type of family. You know, Atari was a family co company. It was a c company that was run by, you know, three brothers, their father, Jack. And that tone played through the company. People felt like family there. We all wanted to pitch in and help out where we could. And so when it came time to do stuff, People rallied and stepped up and got involved. Um, people like Ted and Carrie Takuchi. Ted, again, was another producer at Atari. Um, he's a producer of uh, Kasumi Ninja and Tempest 2000. His wife, Carrie, uh, is the voice of Tempest 2000. You know, super zapper recharge is her. <laughs> but um, they weren't assigned to AVP, but they knew us. They were friends with us. They had this. Ted had this massive wall-sized television experience and they loved hosting people for a movie party and it really gave us this environment when we were doing the pre-production to kind of come together as a group and just pool our ideas. And so folks like Sean and uh, folks from the level design team, we all came over to Ted and Carrie's house and on a series of nights during that summer of 93 and knocked out what became the design for the, the overall game. And again, so I just can't thank those guys enough. So in this photo, um, Ted was over there to visit with um, Jeff Minter for uh, Lamasoff for Tempest 2000. Uh, so I was working with Steve Mitchell on the right of me, and we took a detour to Stonehenge. So sometimes you have to get yourself there to, to be part of it. And it was Ted, and, it was Ted Dikichi who introduced me to um, Andrew Denton. So Andrew Denton was a professional juggler by day and 3D modeler and animator by night. <laughs> and part of the, um, I think a Santa, part of a chapter of the Santa Cruz motorcycle gang or something. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> uh, he primarily used lightweight 3D, which at the time was based on the Amiga. And this came out at an era where, I don't know if you remember, at the end of the Super Nintendo life, Donkey Kong Country arrived. And Donkey Kong Country achieved that very like 3D or Computer graphics were starting to be everywhere in movies, right? After the Terminator 2, 3D graphics really sort of kicked into gear and that super polished 3D graphics look that um, we used the same technique that Donkey Kong Country did, which was use pre-rendered sprites to deliver that polished 3D look. And so when it came to the time for to do the, the box art for the game, I really wanted the game to sort of stand out and really sort of have this extra look to it. Now we weren't going to be able to render those kinds of polys in our game on the Jaguar, but we could get that polished experience and we didn't want it to sort of stand out as a next generation title, which is why Andrew had um, done a bunch of art pieces, art installation pieces of, uh, with an alien model that was super polished and he was able to sign up and do our sketch, which became the box art for the game. So he was the original developer that's all rendered in lightweight 3D. He did some work with, um, the folks on Babylon 5 and some of their spaceship designs, again, that was a light wave driven thing, all based on the Amiga, right? So <laughs> it took, I think, a weekend to render this whole image when we were finally finished with it, but it involved some uh, trips to his um, studio in Santa Cruz a bunch of times coming from Silicon Valley. And this brings us to um, 
Lance J. Lewis. So the legend of Lance J. Lewis. He's um, the star we used as he was a, one of the co-writers of the game of the text and material. And we always just loved his, you know, he was a great guy, but he also just liked the ring of his name. So we named our, the Colonial Marine character is named Lance J. Lewis, even though you see the picture of Sean in the heads up display, we always liked him, you know, enveloping it. And again, Lance was just someone who started as a tester. He became one of our level designers, but really was the heart and soul of the project. Really, it was his dedication of making this game an awesome game and just relentless, wanting to always push us and push us to do more. It was, Lance was always there for us. So um, this is a photo of Lance, uh, you know, in his cube in the, the Atari moment, right? <laughs> Uh, we included his text, and uh, about 10 years, 10, I guess 15 years ago, he and I met up again at a computer gaming expo in San Jose a while back. Now, unfortunately, uh, Lance uh, was in a car accident a couple of years ago, and is one of the two people, Tom Gillen as well, both who have passed on and moved away from us, um, which is always sad, but I'm always just thankful for the time that I was able to spend with these guys and, like, you know, you, you, you know, these people are the salt of the earth, right? They're just like rock solid people who are willing to step up and, you know, and why? Because they want to make something great and they really want to give us their all and that extra time and effort, it just doesn't come, it comes from the within. So thanks Lance, the legend of Lance J. Lewis will always live, you know. Um, at the end of the, of, of the title, when we were finished, just to sort of show my thanks, uh, I work with um, a friend of, my girlfriend at the time who came up with this art design for Alien and I gave everyone who was working on the project this uh, Alien versus Predator <laughs> limited edition Jaguar Test Crew t-shirt. Now, sometimes um, I learned from Leonard Trammell, the technical advisor, brother at, of the Trammell family who worked at Atari and led the technical efforts there. He was, um, he, Leonard was a fun character to work with and he had a sort of a certain way about him and so this shirt wasn't an officially licensed shirt, okay. We get it. <laughs> but he used to have this habit of running around with people in his Sharpies. And if you see you in the halls, he would add a TM to the Alien or Predator logo <laughs> on the back. It's like, okay, we get it. <laughs> he never got me because I always pulled away and I knew what he was doing. But, you know, sometimes that happens, right? <laughs> so um, only people who worked on the game got this shirt. And I was just sort of a, you know, it's a small thing I had learned of um, from my time at Lucasfilm that sometimes having a little bit of swag at the end helps bring everyone around and it's nice to say thanks for the effort. Um, and since then, uh, in 2017, Alien vs. Predator got recognized as the first first person shooter in which um, gamers can play as a monster. So I bring this up just because it's like, of all things about the game, that one of my biggest, I, I have a fundamental belief that life is a two, you know, there's no one, there's no good and bad side. There's, it's your side and someone else's side, or who's to say who's the villain? So if, I really like the dynamic of Alien vs. Predator because it gave us three possibilities to interact and intersect this concept. And I know it's a little bit strange to think, well, we are an alien, but to the alien, the predator, you know, those pesky Marines are a real problem, right? <laughs> so we really wanted this idea that, you know, motivation is from within and you, you know, what might seem like you know, the bad guy to you is really the hero to another, right? And it's just on a concept that I always have want, tried or strived to play with in, in games, and I was really glad that we were able to execute that on Alien vs. Predator. And so, while the images team started us off with the Lynx version, using that wedge issue of the um, horse, you know, the Dark Horse comic characters, we were able to pitch them and include the aliens as part of our design, because it just seemed to be like one element missing. And yes, it meant that we had to tune three different game styles, and yes, that extended our schedule, but from a gameplay point of view, it felt like you had three games in one, right? We really wanted to give us, give the experience their all. And as a person who grew up with a paper who saved up their money to like buy a cartridge every now and then when I could, and taking it home and finding out that the game kind of wasn't exactly what I was hoping for, as a game maker, I always like, wanted to push myself and try to deliver the game, the best game possible. And Alien vs. Predator, when I was at Atari, was the first project where I was able to actually make some change happen and really make a difference and get the extended schedule and get the extra resources and do whatever I needed to do to sort of extend and shape it the way we wanted to see it. So as a vision for the game and as a 
something to deliver on those characters and those films, and we wanted to feel uh, you know worthy of having those characters in our as in our game and do justice by it from a play point of view. It's like yeah, yeah, this is what you know fans of the movie as we are. What this is what we want to see. Um, at the end of the title, everyone in the group they uh, got together and signed a copy of the poster for me. So I help. <laughs> My girlfriend helped me clean up this image of the, the photograph, thank you. <laughs> and I have a few here if you want to take one. I um, just printed some out. Um, it's just really just, again, the spirit of the thing. It's like we all gave up our summers that, that year, and when we got it done, though, it was like, yeah, okay, we can breathe a sigh of relief. So <laughs> it wasn't easy. It wasn't um, always straightforward, but it definitely made a difference for us as far as what we, you know, um, what we could really get out of the system and what we could really manage and maintain. So for us, getting to make it was really, it was just an honor to be able to work with these, these people and really do justice to um, those characters in this, in this game. So there's our sort of funny group photo. <laughs> uh, you know, I, apparently I saw a photo in one of the presentations yesterday, 1196 doesn't look anything like this, 1196 per I guess where the Atari headquarters were, but. <laughs> We, as a bunch of guys, we, um, you know, we rallied and uh, we spent our summers out of, you know, out of love for these characters and made it the best game we could. So uh, that's making Alien versus Predator. <laughs> uh, if you guys have any questions, or I can open up the floor. I'm not sure what the time is, but there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. What do you know about the sequel? Did you have anything to do with that? And it was canceled? So the sequel at the end of our post, you know, when we um, after sent it off to production, we did actually come together and put together uh, about a I don't know, maybe it's like a dozen pages of a design document for a CD-ROM version, basically, which was going to expand upon the same formula that we used all three sides. Um, and but with the addition of being able to do more story and more developed environments, because we had the whole we didn't have to worry about four megs on a cart anymore. Um, this design ultimately um, was how licensing works: is basically the licensor, 20th Century Fox, owns everything. So when you submit anything to them, because it's based on their characters, it becomes their property. So they were in turn able to take those documents in our original game, and they farmed it up back out to um, the Rebellion group, which eventually, I think four years later, came out with the PC version of that, which that all stemmed from that same session. So it was canceled on the Atari Jaguar? It was canceled on the Atari Jaguar. Um, unfortunately, you know, and again, while people like Sam Trammell did change and help this game out, perhaps it came, the chain, those kind of changes came a little bit too late in the, in the Jaguar life cycle to, um, really, you know, extend it. So at a certain point it went from, you know, while at that point he was ready to make and push and push on making that level of great games, the tone shifted again in, into 95 and I left um, Atari in spring of 95. And that title um, got canceled along with it, so. Uh, sure. I, I got a question. Uh, was it ever part of the plan to do networking? I mean, that was one of the great things about doing I mean, there, we had a, a long, ongoing list of features we wanted to see out of the Jaguar. Um, networking ability was definitely on, on it. Even if it was going to be console versus console with two screens, it would have been, we would have, you know, as players, we're up for it. We have the gear, we're ready to go. But this was a push, they saw it as a need to sort of get to market as early as possible. And so a lot of things that was on the wish list stayed on the wish list, unfortunately. So while we wanted to have a multiplayer side, it wasn't gonna be in the cards, certainly not for the cartridge edition. We put it on the wish list. It was one of the features for the CD-ROM version, but again, didn't get made. So, okay, in the back, you, yeah. If you, um, I somewhere in my closet still have an EEPROM cart of it, and every so often it shows up on eBay. I've seen someone who, out there who has a ROM reader or a ROM burner with, you can get the ROM image file, and I believe I thought I saw an emulator with it. 
it is a primarily a technology demo. There's not a whole lot of gameplay, but you can switch between the two characters. So you get to see sort of like this funny predator arm that sort of sticks out in the front, throwing at his discs and things and the spear tool, but it didn't quite, uh, didn't quite um, get there. But, you know, if you do some digging, the internet's an amazing place is what I found, right? <laughs> Oh, right. Um, and if you have any more questions and things, I, as I said, I brought a copy of uh, the sign poster if you want one. You, come up, you can um, see me next door at the autograph session, and uh, I think we have to uh, wrap up. But thank you for your interest, and thank, it was great making AVP for you guys.